chapter four. We are zooming through Proverbs. <laughs> Not that way. What's after Proverbs? Oh, I, it's a secret. It's a secret. <laughs> It'll be the New Testament, though. I keep going back and forth. Uh, okay. All right, Proverbs chapter four. So we have an interesting lesson here to start off with. Um, I'm thinking we got two lessons today, but this first one is interesting in that it's kind of it's a generational lecture. Uh, this is lecture number five for those of you who are keeping count. Um, and it really is about family heritage, and you'll see what that means as we get into it. But the question that I want you to start thinking about is, what are the what are the key things that get passed down in our family? What is the key information, key thinking that we want to make sure that our kids have and our grandkids have? And I think that comes into play in this uh, in this lesson. All right, so let me get started. Verse one. It says here, mine says, hear my children the instruction of a father and give attention to no understanding. So first of all, it starts off, yours may say, hear my sons. The, the point is that it's plural uh, rather than singular. In most of the other places, it's just saying my son, my son, this. But here he's saying, hear my children or my sons. The implication is that there's, uh, he's, he's talking to all of, not only all of his children, but all of his lineage, uh, all of the children and the children's children. Uh, he's saying this is the instructions of a, a father, right, of a father to a child. Um, and, and uh, you know, we'll get more clarity on that as we get into it. But he's saying, you know, th this is this is my instruction. This is this is the instruction that needs to be passed down. This is important for our family. Uh, this this information, and so make sure you capture it and make sure that you pass it on to uh, uh, your children. <clears throat> so verse two says, "For I give you good doctrine; do not forsake my law." So I, I, I give it to you, I pass it on to you, I make sure that you have it. Uh, so this is again a father talking to his son as we start off here. I'm making sure that you have it. But I really want you to have it because it's good doctrine, it's valuable, it's worthwhile, it's good for you, and it's good for our family. Now look at verse 3 is where we have an interesting turn here. It says, when I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me. All right, so here we have uh, the speaker, and if we assume the speaker is Solomon, right, he's saying when... When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. So who is the, who is the, he's his father's son. Who's his father? David. 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 And who's his mother? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yeah. Okay. So just wanted to cut some names to this, right? When I was my father's son, when I was David's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, Bathsheba. Now, we know that Bathsheba had other children, but he's saying here that he was a special one. He was tender and cherished and special uh, by his mother. He was also uh, tender in the sense of uh, pliable, right, and uh, still learning and uh, and loved by him certainly. Um, but but we have this. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is when the word that's used here when he says, "When I was my father's son," you know that in those days. Uh, Sonship was more than just biological. It was uh, it, it was it was something that was spiritual because um, you know in, in those days again if there was if you had a rebellious child <clears throat> that child was disowned by the family. <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me when he's saying here <clears throat> we got a frog that won't go away. Hold on. <clears throat> when he's saying here, my father's son. He's again talking to his lineage. He's talking to those who are obedient, those who are not rebellious, those who will listen, those who will pay attention to this doctrine. I'm, I'm giving you this doctrine. Uh, do not forsake this law, this teaching that I've given to you. Uh, it is it is teaching that I'm giving to my sons, to the ones who will listen, who are obedient uh, to the teaching. So 
In verse four, then it says, he also taught me. He's saying, this is the, this is the lesson that, that I got from David. David gave me these lessons, and I want to give them to you. I want to pass them on to you. They are lessons that he gave me. And so he's saying, listen to them, right? He taught them to me. Uh, let your heart retain my word, keep my commands, and live. He taught them to me, so listen to them, receive my teaching. And again, <clears throat> let, let your heart retain my words. And I've, I've said several times, whenever we see the word heart here in Proverbs, you ought to replace it with the word love. What he's really saying is, you know, love my words, love the teaching, embrace the teaching that I'm giving to you. That That's the, <clears throat> this is the important teaching. So his father is saying to, to Solomon, <clears throat> let my teaching come to you and I want you to love it. And then we know that Solomon says to his son, I want you to love the teaching that I give to you. So it's this, this teaching that's passed down through the generations in love that they want them to the, the, their sons their children to understand them and why you know at the end of it it says keep my commands and live right uh, and again this is live the uh the abundant life live the valuable life live a a real life live a life that's worth living right keep my commands retain my words and then you will have a life that's worth living a, a life that's valuable that's abundant Verse five, then this is the main message that he's passing on, right? This is the, what he taught him. And the, and the, and the, and the, the big statement is get wisdom, Dagnabbit. That, that I just added that. Um, get wisdom, get understanding. What's interesting is you look at verse five and down to verse seven, right? He says, get wisdom, get understanding. Then in verse seven, it says, therefore, get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. Get, 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 get. Five times he's saying get which is really, uh, you know, a, a better word might be purchase, you know, you know, get in the sense of acquire it. Uh, um, make sure that you get a hold of wisdom, make sure that you acquire it, make sure that you go get it. Uh, again, as we've said several times, this is a very active word, not just sit back and accept wisdom. No, I need you to go and get that wisdom. I need you to go and purchase it. I need you to uh, you know, there's a price to be paid for wisdom, and that price is your time, your energy, your effort, and going after it. Go and get that wisdom. And again, in verse five, at the end, do not, do not forget it. Do not turn it away from the word. <clears throat> My voice is just not taking it today. Do not forget it. Do not turn away from the words of my wor mouth. Do not turn away from the path. And we're going to get into that a lot in the second lesson uh, here today. But do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not turn away from the path that you're on with wisdom. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Stay on that path. Uh, don't turn away to another path from, from these words that I'm giving to you. I just lost my place. OK, verse six. <laughs> Verse six, do not forsake her. She will, she will preserve you, love her, and she will keep you. Do not forsake her. Do not go on another path, right? Do not leave her. She will preserve you. She will guard you, as we've said previously. She will guard you. She will take care of you. She will watch over you if you do not forsake wisdom, if you do not forsake her. And then again, love her and she will keep you, love her, and she will hold you. She will embrace you. She will have you. And, uh, you know, just so that your brain is in, in, in the right gear here, love her, love wisdom. We also can replace it with love Christ, right? Love Christ, and he will keep you. He will watch over you. Do not forsake him. He will preserve you. All of that is in the richness of those words. Verse seven, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the main thing, the, the first thing, the, the, the choicest part, if you will. So <clears throat> therefore, get it. <laughs> therefore, get wisdom. wisdom. Wisdom is the most important thing. So again, these are the words from the grandfather, if you will, David, uh, through Solomon to his children that he wants passed down through the generations, and he says, I want you to make sure you understand 
that wisdom is the main thing. Get wisdom. Acquire it. Acquire the acquire Christ. <laughs> get Christ. Get the patterns. Get the principles. You know, one thing that's uh, one of the commentaries pointed out here was that there's uh, there's not a particular set of skills that is necessary in order to acquire wisdom. It's really simply a decision, right? It's a decision to uh, if somebody has doesn't have to be uh, especially intelligent or have a certain background. Uh, it's a decision to get wisdom. It's a decision to. Uh, not forsake her to to love her uh, and, and you know it's it's getting it it's putting in the time and effort but it's not it doesn't take any special set of intelligence or skills it just does take time and effort in order to do so in all the things that you acquire right in all you're getting get understanding make sure that you get wisdom and understanding the price is not too high to acquire her. It is it is it is everything you are. Verse eight. See how quickly we can go through these? Verse eight. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. Exalt her, cherish her, esteem her. Caress her, right? If you look at the end, right, it says when you embrace her, it's it's again this picture of this intimate, loving relationship with wisdom or with Christ. That I I I just can't say it uh, strong enough that that is what is being taught here through all of Proverbs is this intimate relationship with Christ with wisdom. Uh, in order to have success, in order to have this life uh, that is of value. And she will she will bring you honor. She will promote you, right? I mean, it just reminds me of, uh, you know, Matthew chapter 10, when we were there, it says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven, right? It's the same idea here. If you embrace me, uh, then you will be embraced by me. Verse 9, then she will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory, and she will deliver you, right? You will get the victor's crown. Through grace, you get a glorious crown. And remember, we talked about grace last week, right? What is, uh, what, what is this, this crown of glory? Uh, what is this glory? The glory was being accepted by Christ. And so the crown of glory is this crown of being accepted by Christ. Right. This is the this is the final victor's crown, that acceptance, the acceptance into heaven, the acceptance by God into his glory. <clears throat> she will place it on your head. Wisdom will place it on your head. Christ will place it on your head. As you love her, as you keep her, as you do not forsake her, as you go get her, as you put in the time and effort and energy to embrace her. So that really is the first lesson. I want to I just want to pause at the end of it and just let you ponder for a minute. What are the <laughs> lessons that you want to or did pass down in your family? Right? I, I, I think what's interesting here, and we'll see it when we get into even the next lesson, there's a there's a lesson plan. <laughs> for uh that david had to teach his son and that solomon is now doing here to teach his sons and children right that 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 lesson plan is founded on wisdom is founded on christ and and he and he made sure that he took the time to teach that lesson to him and we have that lesson and the lesson plans in front of us in proverbs right and these are the lessons that he took time to teach his children to make sure they understood the principal thing, the primary thing, right, which was wisdom, which was this intimate relationship with Christ. <clears throat> and I just, and it just hits me, you know, how did how did I do in my teaching of my children? Right? Did I have a lesson plan 
that I have, these are the five things I want to make sure my kids know, right? I'm afraid uh, most of that was done through, uh, well, they can watch my life and see what I've been, you know, what's important to me, right? That's good. Uh, I take them to Sunday school and I hope they learn some stuff there. But I think in all honesty, I didn't have a lesson plan. <laughs> I didn't say these are the five key things. And and I think what, what I'm hearing here from the wisest man that ever lived was he had a, he had a lesson plan. He wrote them down. He said, these are the five key things. This is the principal thing. And I also need to make sure they, that I teach them these things. I just think it's a good lesson for us to pass on, right, to our children and our children's children. They need to make sure they have a plan, not just a, I hope it all works out well, but a real written down plan to say, these are the key things. These are the instructions I want to make sure uh, that my family gets right that is passed down through the generations any thoughts on that i just i want to pause there before i go on into the next lesson all right i'll not i'll i paused <laughs> pondering yeah I, i'm pondering too honestly this one made me think through uh, what have I done right? What have I not done right? What uh, what should I do now uh, with regard to getting these lessons on? Uh, uh, so I'm pondering also with you that, uh, you know, the wisest man that ever lived did something that uh, maybe I should pay more attention to with regard to the training of my, uh, of my family, of uh, those who will follow after me. So anyway. Nick with grandchildren <laughs> <laughs> yeah we do right and that that's my point i think that uh are there some specific things i want to make sure my grandchildren understand and uh, I'm, I'm, am i making sure i take the time to do that to have the time with them to have the conversations am i having those conversations or am i just talking about soccer or am i just talking about the last uh, fun thing that we've done together uh, or am i actually having a conversation about the principal thing Right. So <clears throat> there you go. All right, let's go on then to the, the next one, which begins in verse 10. Uh, again, we have a, uh, a lesson here in from 10 to 19 that talks about uh, this uh, decision between the right, wrong, the right road and the wrong road. Uh, it's interesting in verse 10. It says here, my son, receive my sayings and the years of your life will be many. And then in verse 13, take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her for she is your life. Again, this focus on this focus on your life. And in verse 10, it's about the length of your life. And in verse 13, about the quality of your life. And we've seen that before, that uh, he, he's very, uh, it's very important to him that the people, that his, his sons, his son understands that it's not only about the length of your life, but about the quality. If you have a long life with no quality, uh, it is of no value. Both of them are, are always uh, entwined together in the teachings that he gives. So in verse 10, you know, hear my son, receive my sayings, and the years of your life will, make, will be many. Uh, now, let me, let me just, uh, excuse me, just a commentary comment here. Most people believe that in verse 10, uh, we're now hearing from Solomon again. It's not, we're not continuing the conversation from the grandfather, right? From verses, uh, you know, four through nine, you're really hearing from the grandfather. Now in verse 10, we're going back to Solomon. Solomon is now teaching his son, hear my son. So he's, you know, again, he's asking his son to receive his sayings, which include the sayings of his grandfather, which he's just given him, of course but he's given them specific instructions here. And again, in the years of your life will be many. If you want to have a long life, if you want to have a valuable life, if you want to have a rich life, then you need to listen to my sayings and you need to accept them and you need to take them in. <clears throat> Verse 11, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right path. So this is what I was referring to earlier, right? I have taught you in the way of wisdom. The, the real... Some of your translations when I say I, I have instructed you in the way of wisdom. So again, there's a lesson plan here, 
right? There's an instruction. There's an instruction set that he has given to uh, his son. I've taught that to you and you know it now so that you can take it and and uh, and teach that same lesson plan uh, to your children. Um, you know, the, the other thing just to mention, right, is that uh, I've taught you in the way of wisdom uh, as opposed to, right, it says the way of wisdom. If you go down to verse 15 or verse 14, rather, right, it says, do not enter the path of the wicked. Here we have the, the two different paths in the second half, beginning of verse 14. He's talking about the way of the wicked. But here we're talking about the way of wisdom in verse 11, right, and the and uh you know, I've taught you in the way of wisdom, which is different from the way of the wicked, right? There are two different paths, the way of wisdom and the way of wicked, the way of the wicked. Um, I have led you in right paths, right? I have um, I have put your feet on the right steps. Does, does you have a different word instead of paths at the end of 11? Anybody? Uh, no. Everybody says paths? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what's interesting is that uh, in in the Hebrew, there's two different words, and this word um, is closer to a, a closer translation would be uh, the word tracks, like a train track, right? I have I've led you on the right track, um, and the, the difference between path and track is that the track is a um, a firmer, uh, more uh, is is a harder word, uh, a more structured word. If you will, so the idea is uh, there's a path, and eventually the path gets so uh, everybody goes on that path. So eventually we make it into a a track, a, a trail, if you will, uh, because the the path is so well trodden. And and the and the idea here again is that I've led you on the paths that have, have been well trodden. I've led you on the track that have been laid down by your ancestors that that everyone has understood is the right path. The firm path, the path that uh, that that everyone knows is the the path that you should go on. I've taught you the way of wisdom. I've led you on the correct paths, on the right principles, on the right patterns, the ones that everyone knows is correct. Uh, I've led you on those. And I've made sure that you stayed on those, and they are they are straight paths. They are the right ones. They are. Um, and some of your translations instead of right paths may say straight paths, right? The 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 idea is that, you know the first um, the first benefit of being taught wisdom is you end up on straight paths. <laughs> you you end up not on crooked paths, not on paths that are hard to follow. Uh, you, you end up on a path that that's free of treacherous turns that that has a destination, right? And so the the real the, the 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 real first benefit of wisdom is that you're on straight paths. You know what those paths are. They're well worn. Uh, they're being taught to you, and 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 that they will lead you in the right direction. And you 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 don't have any trouble in following them. And that he really clarifies that when he gets down to verse twelve. It says, "When you walk your steps, when you walk your steps." When you walk, <laughs> I can't get the comma, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. <clears throat> when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you um, when you do your daily steps, your daily walk, your daily, uh, every day, you're walking in a certain way. When you do that, uh, you're not going to be hindered. He's really saying when you, you know the daily steps are your 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 daily decisions the 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 decisions you make every day you're not going to be hindered or not going to be hampered in those on those decisions in other words if you have wisdom if you follow on these paths then when you walk you're not going to have any trouble you're not going to you're going to understand exactly where you're going you're not going to be restricted. You're going to have great liberty, great freedom in what you can do as long as you stay on these paths, right? I remember uh, years ago, someone saying to me, the essence of the Christian faith is love God and do whatever you want, right? <laughs> love God and then do whatever you want. If you love God, then you have the freedom to do whatever you want. 
because you're only going to do things that are within the <laughs> understanding of loving God. You have complete freedom as long as you love God. And I think that's exactly what he's saying here, is that as you walk in your steps, you'll not be hindered. If those steps are the paths, the tracks that have been taught to you, that are the principles, the patterns, within those patterns and those principles, you can do whatever you want. You have great freedom. <clears throat> You're not running into barriers. You're not running into police officers. <laughs> You're not running into uh, restrictions on on your freedom. You have great freedom because you are you are taking those paths. Is, let me just pause there. Does that make sense, or am I? Get, are you going? What in your world is he talking about? I see some thumbs up and some like. I'm not sure I want to answer this question because I'm gonna have to give him the wrong answer. <laughs> hey, hey, Rich, I need to struggle with that a little bit. Um, I, I think I think we can still love someone and still mess up so when i hear you say if you love god then everything you do will follow god unfortunately i've seen the opposite in in people <laughs> that's what i struggle with yeah yeah and i think it, it it um it comes down to what how we define love god right yeah Probably. Yeah, and, and the and the the depths to which we do love God, right? Because I think the point is if you actually do love God completely, perfectly, right, then you don't mess up. Then right. you don't make those mistakes. But yeah. <laughs> What's interesting is that um if you if you create a God uh and you love that god then you will often get in trouble yeah. so people so <clears throat> i was listening to a podcast the other day and a guy was explaining to the uh to the guy on the podcast why he left the christian faith uh and that was because uh his uh his wife got cancer and he didn't see that god would is the kind of god that would do that would allow his wife to get cancer and so he he ceased to be a Christian. And I think what we have there is a person who has created God in the image he wants God to be, right? A God that, uh, you know, where there's uh, no punishment for sin, uh, where there, there, there's no, uh, uh, you know, that everything works out wonderfully. Uh, it's the grandfather God, right? When, when, the, when, when all of a sudden we find out God is not like that, uh, then we, uh, then they turn, right? And I think that this is, you know, if you love God and you understand who God is and you love him completely, then I'm saying, yeah, then do whatever you want, because you're going to do things within that love, within that relationship. The problem is that we don't love God that way. We don't love God completely. We try to love something else. And we try to love something else. We love a, a picture of God or an idea of God that's not the God that's in Scripture. And then we then we make all these statements about, well, God is not like that. And if God was like this, he wouldn't do that. And Well, no, God is like that. <clears throat> I, I think under what Tim was saying, we, we <clears throat> you know, that person might have been loving God, but then they found something else to love as yeah. opposed to what God loved. Yeah. And that's what took them off. It yeah. wasn't, it wasn't the God. If they were, you know, focused on the God thing, then they wouldn't, they wouldn't have gotten distracted. But they let themselves get distracted and, and then focused on something else. Besides that's back then, it's a principle, not a promise. So <clears throat> it's a principle, not a promise. Good. Thank you for that. <laughs> Someone listening. <laughs> hey, Rich. Yeah. I didn't have this quote exactly right, but the, when you read, when you run, you will not stumble. Yeah. I can the other day by myself. <laughs> I stumbled on a route, and I, as I was going forward, I said to myself, God said you will stumble, but you will not fall. <laughs> and I didn't fall. So <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so a little different, but sort of had the same context. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, thanks, Curtis. Just keep those ideas to yourself. Appreciate that. <laughs> I want to do it. I'll be glad I followed the word of some. <laughs> So let me let me get to that second verse, that second part of the verse, though, because it's important. So let, let me go back and kind of summarize what I said. So when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. He's saying that when in the normal daily decisions that you make in the normal uh, <clears throat> things that you run into in life, right, your, your steps are not going to be hindered. You're going to be able to do the things that you need to do, that you want to do, that God is pleased with you doing. But then he does say, when you run, you will not stumble. I really think the message here is when all of a sudden things in your life seem to be going really fast, you're not going to stumble off the path, right? You're not going to leave the path is what he's saying. So, so I think what he's really saying here is when crisis comes, right? When the tough times come, right? You're not going to stumble off the path if you have, if you are following the principles, right? If you have loved wisdom. Then when the tough times come, you're not going to stumble off the path like this gentleman did on the podcast, right? He didn't actually love wisdom. He loved something else that he uh, put in the image of wisdom, in the image of God, right? And then when the tough time came, i.e. his sister passed away, then all of a sudden he stumbled from the path, right? And, and what he's saying here is if you actually do understand who God is, and you understand what wisdom is, and you understand the principles, and you grow in those principles, then you're not going to stumble from the path when you run, when things get fast, when when the crisis comes. So, so in this verse, he's saying when in the daily, daily uh, activities and decisions of life, right, he's going to keep you on the path. He's going to, he's going to keep you, <clears throat> your steps are not going to be hindered or not going to, uh, you're not going to have issues. And then when you run, when things get fast, when things get tough, OK, you're also not going to stumble. So he's taking care of you in the day in and day out. And he's also taking care of you when the tough times come. Turn for a minute to Isaiah chapter 40 to a verse that, you know, partly. <clears throat> Go to the right, Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, all the way at the end. <clears throat> right? You recognize this verse. It says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Right? The last two sentences there, exactly what we just read. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faith and not faint. They shall run when they run into stuff, when they run into trouble. They're not going to be weary. They're not going to be overtaken by it. They're not going to be put down by it. And when they walk in the day in and day out, they're not going to faint. They're not going to get tired of it. <clears throat> they're not going to have... Uh, you know, they're not going to wear out from the day in and day out. Why? <clears throat> because uh, their strength shall be renewed. They shall mount up like the wings of eagles. Why? Because they're waiting on the Lord. Because they have their this relationship with God. They understand who he is. They have this relationship with wisdom. And therefore, they, their strength will be renewed in the day in and day out. And when they're running and the crisis comes. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Verse, verse 13. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Right? Again, you know, this is the this is not a casual thing, right? Hold on. Guard it. There's earnest effort involved here. I, I, I see the picture of a the rigorous discipline of an athlete, right? Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard it. It is your life. It is the beautiful life. 
in the, and just to make the connection with the New Testament, right? In John 1, 4, you don't have to turn there, right? In John 1, 4, it says, in him, in Christ was life, right? In him was life. 1 John 5, 12 says, he that hath the son hath life. Life is connected with he that has the son. <clears throat> if you have wisdom, if you have the son, she is your life. Keep her. She is your life. That is what life is. That is what the rich, beautiful life is. You know, on the one hand, I, I, there's a part of me in my head that goes, Rich, you're repeating yourself. The other part of my said, head says, Rich, you're repeating yourself. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, and, and, and it must be because we need to hear it. <laughs> Uh, right, that it's in here over and over and over again, that she is your life, wisdom is your life, Christ is your life, hold on, don't let go, earnestly hold on, <clears throat> and then do not fall into verse 14, <clears throat> do not enter the path of the wicked, do not walk in the way of evil, avoid it, do not travel on it, turn away from it, and pass on, right? He gives two warnings in verse 14, four warnings in verse 15, right? To not enter this path of wicked. So the first thing he says is, do not enter the path. Don't get on it, right? Stay off of it. Uh, don't even try it. Don't enter that path at all. And then the next one says, do not walk in the way. <clears throat> so if you do step on it, certainly don't stay there. Don't walk in that way. Right. Uh, you know, some people just want to taste it. They just want to see it. He says, don't take strides there. Don't take a taste. And then verse 15, avoid it. Uh, some of you may say flout it, right? Rebel against it. Flee from it. Well, you know, this this thing that masquerades as the truth that masquerades as good. You know, it's interesting these days we're getting a lot of spam, right? <clears throat> Where things masquerade as this great opportunity that if we just give them our phone number and our and our credit card, right? We're, wonderful things are going to happen. Uh, you know, this is Satan. Uh, <clears throat> this is what the way Satan uses that same technique, right? With evil, with wickedness, right? He brings it in and makes it look good. Just use your credit card and everything will be fine. Uh, and, and, you know, scripture is saying, don't even get on that path. Don't walk that way. Rebel against it. Flee from it. Uh, was the next thing says, do not travel on it. Again, do not stay on that path. Do not spend any time there. Next thing it says is turn away from it, right? If you, if you get on that path, get off the path, redirect your course, go somewhere else. And then, you know, the last thing says, pass on, just wave it aside, uh, stay on wisdom's path and stay away from this other path. Uh, <clears throat> verse 16 we got to kind of have a transition for the the why. Instead of talking about the path, he starts talking about the people that are on that path. <clears throat> it says, for they do not sleep unless they have done evil, and their sleep is taken away unless they have made someone to fall. Yes. Right? They, it, 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 you know, it, it becomes, <clears throat> evil becomes addictive, right? Sin is addictive. Once you get on that path, you stay on that path. Once you start doing something that you should not be doing, somehow Satan grabs a hold of you and you begin to enjoy it and you stay on that path. And he's saying, <clears throat> you know, they they love it. They, they can't sleep because they want to do it so much. And in fact, they can't sleep because they're just thinking about who else can I bring into this? It makes them feel better about themselves that they can get other people involved, right? If I can just get somebody else in my gang, if I can get somebody else to do the kinds of things that I do, then I must be must be okay. They're trying to make themselves okay. So their sleep is taken. They don't sleep good, right? <clears throat> because they're constantly thinking about how do I get somebody else in this? Because I got to prove to myself that I'm okay. <clears throat> Verse 17. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Or they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. It becomes their sustenance. Carrying out these plans, eating the bread of wickedness, being wicked and being violent, 
is there food and water, right? Is there bread and wine? Is what nourishes them? Is, is what keeps them going? Uh, it, it, again, the, the, the emphasis of these verses really is on the addiction of evil, the way that it grabs them and does not let them go. <clears throat> Verse 18, the path of righteousness, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The path of righteousness, the path of the just, right, is like the morning sun. There's no, there's no clouds on it. There's no shadows on it. There's no darkness on it. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 13, we read, the righteous shall shine forth like the sun. Right? If there's, a, there's always this connection between light and darkness, light being connected with righteousness and doing what's right, and darkness being connected with wickedness. The interesting thing to me in this verse is that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Right? The path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The path becomes brighter the longer you travel on it. And this is really an overwhelming theme of the New Testament, which is growth, which is you ought to be growing in your faith. <clears throat> Turn for a minute to chat to uh, Mark. This is a simple verse, but it's the simple things that we f fall apart on, unfortunately. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Verse 26. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Not an, not an unfamiliar parable, right? It, in verse 26, it says, And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This idea of growth, and he, he uses here the you know agricultural analogy, right, of the, the blade, the head, and the full grain. He's saying that's what the kingdom of God is like, that we, that we grow, that we increase, that we get brighter, uh, as, uh, as Proverbs talks about, unto, unto the perfect day, until we get to the it's interesting that uh, in, in Proverbs, when it talks about the perfect day, they're really talking about the when the sun is at its brightest, which really is noontime, right? It's really saying that you that the path of the righteous, the path of the just is like the shining, shining sun, which gets brighter and brighter and brighter until it gets to its full brightness. But when is that? When do you get to your full brightness? At death. I, I didn't hear you. At death. Right. Well, death, heaven, right? When, you know, scripture says when we see him as he is, right? When we get to full brightness. And, 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 and again, the, 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 the scripture here is saying that we, uh, our path, the path of the righteous is supposed to be this growing, growing constantly brighter until that perfect day, growing in the likeness of him. Growing more like him. So I kind of ask this question, are you? <laughs> are you growing in him? Are you growing in likeness of him? Are you growing in wisdom? Are you going in the principles? Are you growing in the patterns? Are you growing to be more like him? Such that we can get to where I can say, uh, without Tim uh, complaining, I can say, you know, just love God and do whatever you want, right? And the reason is because we ain't growing. We're stuck on some plateau. We're stuck on some understanding of, uh, of who God is and what our relationship with him is. We're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be understanding him more and richer and better and understanding these principles more and richer and better. 
Verse 19. But the path of the, uh, excuse me, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble, right? The darkness, they can't see the patterns. They can't see the light. And the second part said, you know, they don't know what trips them up. They have no clue, right? Without, without knowing wisdom, without knowing Christ, without having the Holy Spirit to help us understand the patterns and the principles, uh, everything trips us up. The, the people in the you know people without Christ have no clue why bad things happen, why they get into themselves into trouble, because they're not following the patterns, right? They're not following the principles. They don't actually know who God is. Matthew chapter six says, "How great is the darkness, right? How great is the darkness of those who don't know Him?" And you know, I got to say this that. When we talk about evangelism, when we talk about helping others to know Christ, we're often thinking about we need to save them from hell, right? We need to do evangelism to save them from hell. We need to do evangelism to get them into heaven, which is absolutely true. But I also think a very powerful reason for help for us wanting to evangelize people is to get them out of this darkness in this life, right? This darkness that they're running around with no clue how this world is supposed to work, how this life is supposed to be rich and abundant and full. This to me is even a greater reason for evangelism. Because you know people that are in darkness. You know people that are struggling in this life because they are not, they, they have no clue what the patterns and principles are to live a good life because they do not have the Holy Spirit. They do not have Christ. And they're running around doing stupid things, getting themselves in trouble because they're not paying attention to these patterns. I just think this is a this ought to be a great prompt for us to evangelize, to reach out to that neighbor that really needs to know about Christ so that he can get his life rich and abundant and full. So. Big messages in this last section is, in my mind, growth. We ought to be growing. And there, then you will walk and not be hindered. Then you can walk in the daily decisions of life and make the right decisions. And you, and when you run, in other words, when the crisis comes, you won't stumble. You won't fall off the path. You'll stay connected to wisdom. You'll stay connected to that love. All right, I'm done. Comments, thoughts, pushback? <clears throat> well, we talk about the, the definition between a path and a track. Well, it's the tracks I thought of was the river. You don't want them, you don't get off. But the rail and usually a derailment is a big accident unless you come across it. Whereas a path, you can get to the track, you can get to the path, you can wander off a little bit and get back on. Uh, it, it's just you know, it's got to be a, a habit you don't need. Yeah, you can take any analogy too far. So I I get you. <laughs> I think that you know it, it's interesting. I remember uh, reading reading an article once about a college that uh, when they set the college up, they put in a bunch of uh, concrete paths around for the students to walk on, and then. Uh, uh, after a while, they found out the, the students actually weren't walking on those paths. They were walking across the grass. They were finding the shortest routes to their classrooms. And uh, so what the college did, instead of uh, putting up signs that said, do not walk on the grass, is they paved over the paths and said, <laughs> OK, if that's where you're going to go, we'll just uh, we'll pave over those paths. And I think th that's the picture that I think is here, actually, where these are the paths that the your your ancestors have shown are the right paths. They know these are the right principles to follow. And so we want you to, to pave over those paths and make sure you, you pass them on to your children such that they are they know that those are the good paths. Those are the paths that actually uh, take them where they want to go. <clears throat> Other thoughts? 
you know, Rich, I've, I've always thought that where I struggle the most is getting the wisdom out, you know, because you, you made a good point earlier about sharing it with your with your loved ones, especially with your children. Well, I've struggled in getting it out, getting out the right way so I'm not coming across too strong or, you know, oh, my gosh, here comes dad's lecture kind of thing. Um, but I think we all struggle with that. And I think maybe the a good answer for that, maybe not the best, but a good answer would be living by example. Because sometimes you can't say the right words and no matter how hard you try, it's going to come across wrong. So, you know, but that's a good point. Getting it out. I think that, you know, the answer is always both, right? You, you, there's no question that living your words have got to be consistent with your living, right? And and they they will they will uh, follow the things that you do more often than the things that you say. But to, but to not be clear about what is true also is a mistake. So I I, I just think it's both, and uh, we need to we need to just think about and, and even if it is just the way you live, what is the what are the things in the way you live you want to make sure you show them. Right. What are what are the key things? I think we just need to think through that ourselves and make sure we're clear on, uh, you know, why am I doing the things I'm doing such that I instruct my children? Right. I, I just think we need to think through that clearly and know what those things are and not just kind of rumble through life and go, well, I, I hope you figured out that those things over there, those are the good things I want them to learn. These things over here that I do, I don't want them to learn those things. Right. We just need to be clear on that ourselves. Anything else? All right, let's move into prayer request time then. Turn off the recording.